We only have 20 minutes, and it really takes us five minutes to cross the stage. It's beautiful. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name's Robin. Um, they've already been introduced. We only have 20 minutes, so we're going to dive right in. Uh, the previous session was entitled, It's Never Been a Better Time to Be an Entrepreneur in Europe. I think that's true. I think it's hard to argue with that. Um, but usually when you utter that phrase, it's never been a better time to be a European entrepreneur, there's always a but that comes after it. But we're still lagging behind the US. But we don't have the humongous companies a la Facebook and Google yet. Um, and one of the buts that gets um, uttered quite a lot, it's never been a better time to be a European entrepreneur but we still don't have a digital single market in Europe. Uh, so that's something that we're going to talk about today. Um, I don't think we could have had two better um, panelists for that discussion. Um, Estonia, obviously one of the most technologically advanced countries in Europe, and Ms. Cruz, um, the former European Commissioner, Commissioner for Digital Agenda. And you laid a lot of the foundation, and you played an instrumental role in getting you know, the digital single market strategy uh, there in the first place. Uh, so now that it's finally there, this strategy, these 16 points, are you happy with them now that you're no longer a commissioner? Or would you have liked to see more or better? Would you mind if I just correct you on one issue? Sure. When you were mentioning Europe is lagging behind the US, we are not lagging behind when we are talking about talent. Look, it is all talent. We, by the way, are beating them talking about talent. We are beating them in taking initiatives. And now we have to implement all those talents and uh, initiatives in giving them indeed a single uh, market uh, ecosystem for startups. Still a lot to do. So if you are asking and then uh, I'm answering, uh, are you happy with the six points? Well, I count my blessings, but let's speed up for we are in a hurry. Um, that's true. Um, so and one of the, the, the things that always struck me is that uh, the digital single market strategy, it's taking a lot of time. Uh, it's not a new thing. It's an, it, it, essentially, it's a digital equivalent of the Single um, Markets Act that's been there already. Um, so this is the digital equivalent. Why is it taking so long? Why is it taking so much time? Well, a democracy takes time. And um, during my uh, term in office in Brussels, President Ilvis was my advisor, and we discussed quite a number of times what could be speed up, but I don't need to explain when there are 28 members of the family, 28 uh, countries that are involved in the European um, building out. Then uh, it is taking more time than uh, you normally think should be needed. Having said that, and that was what we also discussed behind the stage. There is an opportunity at the moment. We shouldn't wait till all the 28 are ready to join the party. Let's just unite and combine our efforts of all those who are really involved. And a couple of countries, and especially talking about the Nordic countries and the Netherlands, and there, there are a couple of other ones, I'm absolutely certain, are joining that party when we take initiatives. And what I'm a bit feeling sad of is that first with the Greek crisis, later on with the refugee uh, issue, the challenge, and no doubt it is a challenge, but come on, we need a single digital market to afford to have quite a number of people in a decent living situation. So. Why not taking initiative with a couple of countries and especially talking about the startups? For you are backing us, I imagine. And if you are just raising your hand, then we know for certain that you are backing us. Mr. Ilvos, as president of one of the 28 member states, what are your thoughts on this? Well, let's always keep in mind that while we have a lot of startups, of the 20 largest IT companies, uh, 14 are American and the rest are Chinese. Uh, so, I mean, all startups want to become big companies. Uh, and I'll just, just to understand the, the, the impact of the lack of a single market on startups. Four years ago, I read in my newspaper about a young man just graduated from 
technical, the technical university had gotten $300,000 for a startup. So I invite, invite him to tea as I try to encourage entre young entrepreneurs. And after he told me what he was doing, he said, I'm sorry, Mr. President, in two weeks I'm moving to the United States. I said, why are you doing that? He goes, well, it's, the market is 330 million. We, don't, we have 28 markets, why bother? Six months later, his startup still had 4.6 million, and last October, he sold his company for $100 million. He could not have done that in Europe, or it would have been very difficult. Why? Because we have 28 different markets, we have different VAT rules, intellectual property rules are all different, which means, whereas in the United States, being a large single market, you can do that. And the problem is that our legislation is not catching up to technological reality, and we are moving into a world in which the old paper-based serial processing rules of f the past 5,000 years, ever since we've had bureaucracy and laws, those don't work the same way as the technological world. So we need to push this to create a single market of 500 million. Unfortunately, it's not going as easily as we thought it would. A single market for goods is, well, it exists already for 20 years, but it is easier to buy or to, to ship and sell a bottle of, wine from the Algarve in Portugal to bring it up to the north of the Arctic Circle in Lapland and sell it than it is to buy an, I, an MP3 across a border. Uh, now, Ms. Cruz, you kickstarted the Startup Europe initiative uh, within the European Commission. Can you briefly talk about what that is and how that fits into the digital single market strategy? Well, it is talking about those issues to get, uh, indeed, all those hurdles out of the way that everyone is making up his mind if he is going on in Europe or if he is leaving uh, the continent. But I don't accept that there are less opportunities here, and we, we have to make it more comfortable, so to say, for those who, who are. And I'm more thinking of uh, all those opportunities for venture capital. And we should just focus on, on those issues for quite often when a startup is successful and a couple of startups went into unicorns from your country, Ilves. And well, when, when we are aware of that, when are they leaving when in the scale-up phase it's not any more possible in the third or in the fourth round to get your money? And there we need to get an involvement also matching with pension funds, with uh, the European Investment Fund, uh, and so on. And there we can do quite a bit in pushing. So I'm not waiting till the democracy has finalized the whole digital single market. We can already just push our systems in which it is far more challenging for a startup to stay in Europe. And I don't mind if someone is selling his business up to everybody for who am I to say. But we shouldn't make it an, a must because there is no uh, possibility to finance your scale-up phase and after. Um, so on the, one, on the one hand, we have this outline of a digital single market strategy, which is great, and it has the word startups in them six times, I counted. Um, so that's already, a, you know, that's already a victory in, in, in some way, uh, because getting the startups on the agenda of the decision makers on European uh, policy level is already you know, half the battle. Um, but then on the other hand, you have these decisions being made, for example, the safe harbor um, pact that was um, annulled effectively, uh, and then you have the net neutrality uh, law that was just voted in the European Parliament, which is very uh, weak compared to the US. Um, you know, allows for zero rating, uh, leaves loopholes when it comes to creating fast lanes for ISPs. You have the CEO of Deutsche Telekom already saying they might charge startups extra uh, for some services. So how do you harmonize or how do you marry those decisions with a strategy that can foster and, and stimulate European entrepreneurs? 
Well, number one, we need to be very transparent in how we read that agreement, talking about net neutrality, talking about... And it shouldn't give a loophole for those who seem to be a bit more sharp for their own case. It is, and we have discussed that quite often, it is a matter of just giving opportunities in an open internet position and where the startup is getting the floor, so to say. And I was quite pleased with the discussion at that time with Parliament that we could come to a agreement in which uh, it was, for me, clear what was possible, yes and no. And I think, and that is, by the way, one of the challenges. You are so strong, you are with so many, so raise your voice. It is the startup voice that is making sense now. If people are talking, if politicians are talking about strengthen our economy, we are facing already now, and your country is the best, Mr. President, example in, in showing that a disruptive economy is not only excellent for an economy, but is also excellent for creating jobs. But you need a market. You are too small. We all need a market. And there, the startup can make, if you are uniting your vote, like the farmers. So unite your voice and go to Brussels and go to your capitals and just face politicians that it is over in being neglected for everybody is now aware that you are not only the hope for the future, you are the base for today for building out our disruptive economy. And but if you allow me one sure. sentence adding to that, the consumer is interested in your products. And the consumer, at the end of the day, for me, is the king or the queen. And it depends whatever is being presented. But you, with your creativity, you are showing that a disruptive economy and that such a society can make a lot of difference. And that is what we are very good at in Europe. I continue the, the couple of things. One is that we really need to start looking at our legal environment. I'll give you one, uh, two examples. One, you mentioned the, the uh, Safe Harbor, uh, Harbor Agreement. That, that court decision pushed data protection back onto the national data protection agencies. So now we have 28 of them deciding what can be transferred and what cannot be instead of a single European one. What is that going to do for IoT? I mean, what happened, okay, what is, what is going to happen when you're driving your European car that is internet-based and you get to your national border? Schengen may still exist, but your car won't, perhaps, won't be able to cross over the border because the data can't be transferred. I know that's an extreme example, but the point is that our legal system does not think in terms of the borderless world, and we have to get around that. The other side of that is just again what we're working on in Estonia right now as a sort of as a pilot is that why are people against Uber? Well, it's not only the kind of uh, the labor unions; it's also the tax authorities don't like it because they don't know who are you getting money. So what we're doing is an app, and we're developing with Uber a system so that Uber drivers will automatically have their receipts reported to the tax agency, which means that in a lot of countries which are violently against Uber for where the tax authority is against it, I mean, there is a software solution to this. But this means we have to, we have to look at our legal systems far more than we have, because what, what has happened is that technology has moved ahead at, at the exponential rate of Moore's law, and, uh, and our legal system has moved along linearly and with a very low slope. Just adding to the remarks of the President, um, it is indeed a legislation that we are faced with that is based on yesterday. And you can't blame them for that, of course, it's always taking time before, and there are not many legislators that are able to fulfill what the near future will present. So having that as a fact, then we should take into account, and I'm coming back to the consumer, we should be much more aware for, with your example of Uber, but also with examples of 
I grew up when there were still a bank office, uh, offices at the corner of the street, and you went with your money to the bank at the corner of the street. When you were planning a um, an holiday, you went to the travel agency on the corner of the street. That's not anymore at stake. And people, if you are just mentioning it to the youngsters, they are saying, were you that crazy? Were you going to the corner of the street? Well, since we have our social devices, since we have that mobile that can take our information and give us the information, a consumer, a, a citizen, is not accepting anymore that he can't make up his own program when, where, and what he will just get for information. Having said that, and that is a bit surprising, and exactly what the president is saying, that was not a big rumor in society for people who are saying, come on, uh, banking uh, issues, I do myself on my uh, iPad, computer, whatever. And travel planning, I do it myself. But now with Uber, so, and that is just a circle of people, but if you are asking the citizen, what is the most convenient for you? Well, to be honest, to look at my mobile, and if it's Uber or blah, blah, or whatever, but there are a couple of those initiatives from startups that in the meantime are real grown-ups that give me comfort, that give me quality. So who is thinking that that is not at stake? And again, we need to focus on what the client, the citizen, is wanting with his instrument in his hand. Right. Um, quickly reiterate, um, one of the points that you mentioned is that startups need to get their voices um, heard. Uh, so there are a couple of alliances, the European Tech Alliance, I don't know if Nicholas discussed it. There's also Allied for Startups. So these are all associations that are starting to pop up to kind of unite the voices of startups within Europe. Um, it really does make a difference. Uh, they're not sitting in an ivory tower uh, not listening, so you have to talk to your policymakers and tell them what you need. Um, so that's very important, I think. Um, so quickly on, on Estonia as a, as a country, you've adopted online very, very early on, uh, online voting, um, paying your taxes online, etc. I also got this, coincidentally, uh, the e-residency on Monday, so it's a good coincidence. Um, can you briefly discuss if Estonia, as a digitally or technologically advanced country, can you serve as a blueprint for other European countries? Or is it something unique to Estonia and the fact that you're so small that you can't really replicate anywhere else? Well, I, I think it's perfectly scalable. You just need more server space. So I'm not really too worried about that. And I remember I uh, appeared, I mean, when I uh, tried to talk about, I talked about our system to some small Latin American countries. They said, well, we can't do, we can't do things because the Americans are so big and we can't be like them. For us, it was the opposite. Uh, I mean, digitization is something that uh, removes the advantage of economies of scale because you can do things just as well and, and with less, uh, le less capital investment. This, what we are doing in Estonia, yes, is for the moment advanced, but it's a constant battle who's ahead. But I think that it, things will not really move until we get uh, the services that we have, for example, a digital prescription where all prescriptions are online and you can go to any pharmacy in the country. Until we do that cross-border, and that's where I would like to see work, first of all, in the Nordic-Baltic region where we are all fairly advanced compared to some other parts of, with the exception of the Netherlands, which of course is also up there. But the point is that when you start getting sort of citizen services, you can, so if you get sick, if you get sick in, uh, in, if you're an Estonian who gets sick in, in Amsterdam, he just takes his card, goes to the pharmacy, sticks it in, does his thing there, whatever two-factor identification you need to do, and gets his medicine, that, I mean, that's already showing the citizen that you have, you know, thanks to cross-border movement of services, you can, uh, you're much happier. Right now, you can't do that. So my goal right now, the first step would be either with Estonia and Finland, Estonia and Latvia, or Estonia and Denmark, some, some combination of technologically advanced countries coming together, making the hard political decisions that, yes, we're going to try to take a step forward and move beyond the current, uh, current 
state of affairs. And that requires political will, but I think it's doable because that way I think we can move through Europe and get a, a Europe uh, whole and digitized. We're out of time, but I have a really good question for Ms. Cruz. What are you up to these days? Uh, Post-European Commission, uh, you became the special envoy for startups and Startup Delta. Briefly explain what that is. Well, after my term in office, after 11 years uh, being active in Brussels, first as a commissioner for competition policy, later for the digital agenda, I thought I did survive bureaucracy, so there is life after. And then the prime minister and the minister of economic affairs of the Netherlands came over for coffee and asked me to be the special envoy. And I had to think over. But I'm so intrigued by what you are doing, startups. I'm a strong believer that that is the new fundament of our society. So I said, OK, for one and a half year, no payment for no salary for then I have to go to Parliament to explain what I'm doing, and I won't, and a very strong team. And I got that, so we are busy to do that. But just having the floor, I would love if you would ask the president for he explained to me uh, talking about privacy for that is often misused in this field by politicians could you add a little bit more about privacy uh, what your thoughts are clouds and what have you and the other one backstage the president was mentioning something and i think that could be tremendous could you touch upon that one too Sorry, I take over your role. We're all really way over time, but... <laughs> well, what I want to say about privacy is that I think it's being abused. I mean, the idea of privacy is used actually to advance protectionism. I mean, privacy is when, what people are objecting to or what are worried about in privacy, I mean, it's basically is confidentiality. I think the, the, the worries are misplaced. My big worry is data integrity. To put it bluntly, it may be I mean, kind of, I mean, I may not like it if someone knows my blood type, but I'm much more concerned that if my records are on, I have digital records, that someone changes my blood type. And I think the same thing applies to, I mean, to IoT all over, is that the real issue we should be worried about is data integrity. And that's getting lost in the current debate, and we are, in fact, uh, yeah. Well, we're just, by, by concentrating on the confidentiality side, we're missing the bigger picture. On what, which part of what we're, what I'm trying to do, I think, in Estonia, and try to get the north of Europe all onto a, more or less a single uh, platform of uh, a distributed data exchange layer with two fact, with, with a strong identification whatever it ends up being, but so we can, in fact, have all of Northern Europe interconnected with services to be then an example for the perhaps somewhat more laggardly rest of Europe, but that's not including the Netherlands. See that for next time. We're all out of time. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you for listening. Thank you.